It's a necessity. People demand information and entertainment. I don't think television does anything for you. I don't think television matters. People have much more potential richness in their lives as a result of television. Mankind might be better off if television were not invented. This instrument can teach, it can illuminate, it can inspire. Otherwise, it's just lights and wires in a box. And thanks to television, you're near me every day. And thanks to television, you can hear me say, howdy doody, cross the country, time to join me in a fun spree. Cause I see you, and I see that you're seeing me. This series is about humanity's fastest revolution and about its power over all our lives. In just half a century, television has covered the planet. And today, television is on the verge of a new global explosion. In almost every country on Earth, children only know a life with television. For many of them, watching television will take more of their waking existence than school or family or work or anything else. For them and for all of us, the box in the corner has changed our lives. Tonight, and for the next 13 programs, we're looking at television around the world. The images, the stars, the makers, the money, the audiences. And we'll be looking, too, at what television has done to us all. The homely and highly perishable invention that came of age with the nuclear bomb. Senator John F. Kennedy. Ever after, you know, 
once upon a time like the fairy tales. Unless, of course, you don't like living. Of Java. Despite the regular evening downpour, in the village of Chibodas, the procession leaves the headman's hut as usual. Nearby, hundreds of farm workers and their families have crowded into the tiny village hall. For all of them, this is the highlight of the day. Television has come to Chibodas. San Quentin Prison, California. In A-Wing, the television sets are on as usual in most cells. The majority of prisoners are locked down here for 24 hours a day. Tony Lara, convicted of murder 20 years ago, has no release date. Like many prisoners, he spends 18 hours a day watching television. Harbin, China. The Sun family are together for New Year's Eve dinner. As usual, the television is on in the corner. Brazil. In the one-room wooden shack, which is home for Jose Dolivera, his wife and three children, the family gather to watch a glossy soap opera. The new color television set will take years to pay for. In the mid-80s, television pictures from space have become a routine miracle. While in some frequencies, planet Earth hurls out more energy than the sun in messages for half a billion TV sets. It's all the result of the swiftest revolution in human history. In 1950, there were less than five million sets in only six countries. By 1960, the television revolution had poured 99 million sets into 68 countries. By 1970, 250 million sets had arrived in 130 countries. Today, television has spawned 657 million sets. And around the world, in 162 countries, TV is seen by two and a half billion people. One country above all has become the ultimate television addict. Japan's electronics industry pours out television sets for the world. Japan's own audience watches more TV than viewers anywhere else. In Tokyo, the set is on for eight and a half hours a day. For the Japanese housewife, television shapes the day. Every morning, you know, when she wakes up, just switch on the TV set. Oh, this program is now on, so I have to make uh, the breakfast for my family. And, um, oh, this news program starts. I have to go upstairs to awake my husband. And uh, or this program said, hey kids, you have to leave now. You can go there. Often at school, people ask each other, what did you see on TV yesterday? 
So if you don't watch, you're out of touch. Uh, the teachers have to make jokes in every 50 minutes. And because they, in the TV, that commercials come up in every 50 minutes. So the, the kids cannot endure longer than 50 minutes. The television addiction may have a special grip in Japan. But viewers around the world recognize the binding spell of the TV screen. That tube is so seductive. You can't get away from that tube. I have a five-month-old baby who just sits there and glares at the television. She can't even talk. I know how seductive it is. We all gather here in the village square and watch television from the opening to the last program every day. Television is very much an essential part of our life. Watching TV is as important to us as having bread with our meal. The children are never around when you want them. They're always watching TV. Once television is on, you can't get a child to run an errand. They won't do anything in the house either. At a market research center in New York, children act out their favorite TV programs as part of a research project into the power of TV commercials. Like their generation across America, these children will spend a total of three years watching TV before they're 18. This project is part of a major new growth industry, trying to understand what the television addiction is doing to us all. Television brought the family together, but not face to face. Today, television tells most of the stories to most of the people most of the time. The new role of parents, the new role of teachers, is to sort out what television teaches. Poor kids get smarter. Rich kids get dumber if they watch a lot of television. In general, I think it can enrich people's lives rather than destroy them, erode them, or generally screw them up. It has the power to reaffirm prejudice. It seldom has the power to change them. It's the most powerful medium ever to affect the thinking and behavior of people. And I believe that to be absolutely true. I'd say you simply cannot have a modern society without television. It's as simple as that. The sex, violence, cheapness, murder, automobiles. Whatever is wrong in modern life, you'll find wrong in television. And out from your TV set. You will obey me while I lead you in the garbage that I feed you until the day that we don't need you. Don't go for You can pin almost anything on the box. Your mind is totally controlled. It has been stuffed into my mold, and you will do as you are told. Television is destroying democracy or its propaganda for the status quo. TV breeds violence or it's a numbing drug. Television is educating the world or driving it crazy. That's right, folks, don't touch that dial. Well, I am. It seems television insists on mixing paradox with its power. Tony Lara has received his view of the world since his murder conviction in 1965 exclusively through television. Shut away from all other inputs, his experience offers an unusual chance to explore what television does to us. Well, you have to understand that the only exposure I have to society is through this medium, through this window. Uh, rather than a window, I would say maybe it might be a half of a pane. It seems Tony Lara's exceptional exposure to television has sharpened his awareness of its ambiguous power. People that have television sets they don't use their imagination as much as they did in the old days. From that point of view, from that, from that convict's point of view, I think it's a bad, negative thing. From a correctional official standpoint, it's positive and because television tends to hypnotize you. But for Tony Lara, 20 years of receiving the world through his television screen has also delivered a remarkable bonus. As a result of watching Dr. Bronowski's documentary series, The Ascent of Man, he gained credits for a master's degree. For him, television has been both a drug and a unique stimulant. It has also offered tantalizing images of freedom to a man who won't be considered for parole until the year 2006. 
moonshots. I remember thinking, here I am sitting in a tiny little cell, and these guys are way up there in that little light up there. It seemed desolate, desolate like what prison life is like. Television can show you the face of the moon, but it can also show you the face and heart of man. I just hope we don't get too big for our britches. It's an awesome responsibility. The person behind the camera, the person who asks the questions, the person who explains the complex world, which for the first time in our history, mankind is capable of extinguishing life on this planet. We must not let television control us. We must control television. By control, I mean the people who are responsible for television must use it properly. And that's why this instrument is so crucial and the people who run it have such an obligation. For the companies which make television, it can mean money and power. America's three major commercial networks share a multi-billion dollar scramble for advertising money, which has made U.S. television one of the biggest businesses on Earth. There's an awful lot of money in it, and it's enormously profitable. When you hear these people from American television talk, uh, if they're talking to the general public, they'll tell you that they are a uh, great information and entertainment and cultural medium. But when they talk amongst themselves, they speak very proudly of the fact that they're an advertising medium and the best advertising medium in the world. The problem with television in this country is that commercial television makes so much money doing its worst that it can't afford to do its best. Money, 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 money. Advertising on American television is a $20 billion a year business. While the unique skills of the U.S. TV industry produce the television the world watches, earning $500 million a year in overseas sales, TV at home can take as much as half a million dollars for one 30-second commercial. The result is a non-stop battle for advertising and audience ratings in a system where the loss of a single ratings point can cost the television company $50 million a year. It's this competition for advertising which British broadcasting has always been regulated to avoid for fear of the impact on programs. In America, the programs must respond to the priorities of competition and money. Anything to make a buck, anything to get the rating, instead of the true function of television, which is to communicate, to teach, as well as to entertain. Delhi, India, the center of a very different kind of television industry. This is the main studio for Doordarshan, the Indian TV system serving a potential audience of 750 million people. From this one studio comes the national news, drama, entertainment and education. Indian TV is a single channel monopoly and Doordarshan is a government owned offshoot of the Ministry of Information. Indian TV, like the country it serves, is very poor. Its stated priorities are utterly different from those of American television. I think it is important for education, for uh, vital information about uh, farming and uh, other such, uh, because our country is very large and we still have uh, quite a high rate of illiteracy. The visual is so much more effective than the spoken word. In the mid-70s, India pioneered satellite distributed television, sending educational programs to thousands of remote villages. But though the emphasis remains on television as an aid to development, there are doubts about a more disturbing power resulting from the government monopoly. Not only is it a state monopoly, it is a monopoly of the ruling party, Congress I. So that the opposition will not normally get a chance. If you don't like a particular newspaper or its policy, you can throw it away and you can subscribe to another. In case of broadcasting, you can do nothing. This is the only channel that is available to you. A 
But today, the industry which makes television, whether the power lies with big business or government, faces a new revolution. In the mid-80s, people like Mark Gordon are pioneering a television Klondike which threatens the landscape of the past 50 years. In his apartment in New York's South Bronx, Gordon has installed his own satellite receiving dish assembled from a kit. Feeding directly from scores of television satellites now in orbit 22,000 miles above his apartment and bypassing broadcasting institutions and national boundaries, Mark Gordon can tune in to more than 300 channels of television from all over the world. Now, I'm on Annex C now, which is the third Canadian satellite. Now, I keep moving it over. What I'm doing, I'm looking in here. Bingo, I got a bird. I wanted to prove a point to, shall I say, the industry that I can do something like this and anybody else can do something like this. Here's another one. In a matter of a couple of years, those spacings will sort of reduce by 50% because there'll be more satellites up in the, in the air. Roughly, I can get about 300 channels now and probably 600 channels in a few years from now. The vision of television abundance is almost certainly something of an illusion. More television undoubtedly means more of the same programs if the patterns of the past 30 years are maintained. J'étais en train de penser à Steven. Dubbing in Paris for the French version of Dynasty. In France, as in almost a hundred other countries around the world, the American series is watched by millions. Everywhere we seem to be watching the same things, and they're usually the product of the American and British television machines. Come in. In Delhi, a wealthy Indian family watch an episode of The Professionals on their video. Let them come to us. In Indonesia, a whole village is spellbound by a British comedy, though they don't understand a word of it. But in the mid-80s, planet Earth's most familiar face probably belongs to Lucille Ball. Every day of every year, she's on the screen somewhere in the world. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. The American story machine has propelled the most powerful television myths of our times to the ends of the earth. Star Trek has colonized more than 100 countries. To boldly go where no man has gone before. And so I, I looked around and in this back room that I could see at the other end of the restaurant there was an ancient black and white set. And I was on the air as, as Captain Kirk in this little tiny town in the Caspian Sea. Obviously, it is a powerful PR factor for nations. Whether it's a good thing for the world to become homogenized, obviously not. It, whether it's a good thing for the world to have more common points of reference, obviously yes. It depends which it is. For news, when it happens. Come in, Good evening, viewers. In the news tonight, Mrs. Thatcher calls for a midterm poll in Britain on the 9th of next month, a year ahead of schedule. Okay. There's no government anywhere that is tackling the problem. Kinnock's off to a fast start in Labour's leadership race. Up on it, hit the card. You make it up. Most of the people, by all the polls that I've seen, say they get most of the information about what's going on in the world today uh, from television. Whether that's good or bad is beside the point. That that's where the action is. Because I have a son that's going to go into the army. Cream cakes in the box, I mean. That's great. You want to be careful not to put weight on, you know. It's possible for an event to take place in Sydney and an hour later the pictures could be seen in Washington. Television news being so fast especially, I think creates a whole new news interest. The old proverb, a picture speaks a thousand words. You have people seeing the event rather than reading about it. 
Television is changing what we know and when we know it. Until the modern television age, this was always jealously guarded by politicians. Now, governments themselves fall on television. And so, we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility. Thank you very much. In Belfast, nothing is simple. This fire broke out, apparently deliberately started. The fire was opened up. Just down the road. There are very few events that are natural events that aren't shaped in one way or another to attract the attention of television. The, the, the president has press conferences at certain hours where he can get a maximum audience. I've invited Soviet Deputy Premier and Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko to meet with me at the White House on September 28th. Every punchline is designed to fit into television. Let me try this. Sono molto contento di essere qui. This is what one pound would buy for the housewife in groceries at the end of the Tory government. The same thing is true of special interest groups, good ones and bad ones. Uh, it's true of everybody that wants to get their views or their faces or their organizations uh, well known. Most parades and demonstrations take place in the afternoon, in time to make the evening news. One sees bedraggled groups outside nuclear stations or pits or whatever, but the numbers will grow enormously if they think there's a chance of being on the 9 o'clock or the 10 o'clock news. Yeah, that's a real problem. Rockets take off in prime time. Astronauts do tricks for the evening news. And the shuttle has to touch down in a live news show. Even the IRA explode their bombs at four o'clock to make the six o'clock news. If we only covered what uh, happens naturally and without trying to attract our attention, all we'd ever cover is hurricanes and uh, volcanoes. It has been shown to be a medium of shock rather than a medium of explanation, of uh, exposure rather than exposition, uh, of emotion rather than of intellect. This is because of the intensity of its picture quality. It is a tabloid medium. We want to take you live now up to the northwestern part of Marion County, up to the intersection of Highway 465 and Northwestern Avenue, where you can see a major traffic accident. We do know that it is a fatal accident. We have crews on the scene. If you're expecting anyone coming home through that intersection, I'm now told that one person is uh, confirmed dead and two people were injured. This marvelous, exciting medium must not just consist of bloody good pictures. It's got a responsibility to society, to our children, and not to spread violence or unreason. Look here. Incredible, isn't it? It's a four-wheel drive vehicle with five people that went in. Look at that girl. She was just absolutely scared to death. And you can see that the water doesn't look like it's going very fast, but it's really moving. The problem is that when people go in the river, usually they drown. It has been allowed to spread violence and unreason too much. I think violent action, a riot, a sit-down, uh, a visual rowdy protest has been the ticket to the television screen. The test isn't whether it's good news or bad news. The test is, is it news? There's nothing we'd rather do that have nothing but good news, which means that civilization and humanity are making advances. Uh, but it has to happen before we can treat it as news. But when Japanese television later replayed the stabbing of this politician in slow motion, all the violence was coming from television itself. Then Governor Connolly is shot. He's already been hit. He's already been hit. At the bottom of the screen, the head shot. That's the shot that blew up his head. 
It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in the movie. Oh, God, that's awful. Over there, look, over there, over there. Heavy viewing of television violence can make you feel more insecure, can make you accept repressive measures. We have studied the effect of television on the political orientation of viewers. The more people watch television, the more they will agree or favor repression and limitation of personal rights. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. So violence can make viewers support law and order. Richard Nixon was aware of this when he put images of urban destruction into his election commercials for television. The first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. This appeals to fearful and insecure people. And historically, it has been the, one of the most favorite uh, ways of controlling people, of saying, there's the enemy and I'm going to protect you, just support me. Images of violence might make some viewers more right-wing. In Vietnam, pictures of violence produced the opposite effect. People wanted the war stopped. War is hell, the great American general said. That was rhetoric until Vietnam. You saw that war. I think if your country had seen World War I on television, World War I might not have lasted as long as it did. The television war, the war went on for 12 years of it. Half of it was on television every night. The war became an electronic war. For better or worse, the electronic hearth was where history was being made. And this country will never be the same again. I don't think the world that has television will ever be that way again. The Reagan story is coming from uh, New York. It's a regular satellite transmission, uh, which comes into Europe at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, it's recorded in Brussels and played out again to the Eurovision I Network. What we're seeing here is Reagan's State of the America Union address. Again. This is the power of television. In the Moscow newsroom, they are watching the American Defense Secretary discuss live President Reagan's message. The one thing that the President wants more than anything else is our real uh, significant and uh, major reductions in arms on both sides. He for the moment, that, that live and dangerous remarks like this can be videotaped for party members only. But one day soon, the Soviet authorities will have to contend with viewers with their own satellite receivers. I, it's very hard for me to estimate what the Soviets will do. I would think that they would see that it's enormously to their interest to make reductions too, that they could improve the quality of life for their citizens. If they They'll did. block it by every means available to them. Their economy is all to blazes and having a very rough time. I should think they've got enough uh, technology to know, to know how to block any kind of programs that they don't want their people to hear, which is sad, really. In divided Berlin, television is a shared experience. On the west side of the wall, families are tuning in to the West German news. Here's the Deutsche Fernsehen with the time show. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Die Vorsitzenden der drei Bonner Koalitionsparteien, CDU, CSU und FDP, Bundeskanzler... Over the war in the communist sector, most viewers will be tuned to the same news from the West. Hier ist das deutsche Fernsehen mit der Tagesschau. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. The greatest part of the DDR, the majority of East Germans know the West through this window, an exotic world for East Germans. In the evening, the class enemy enters the living room, a colleague who worked in East Germany once wrote. For those in power in East Germany, it is exceptionally difficult to build an independent socialism against West German television. What is this? Amerikanisch? 
communist authorities know that 90 percent of east germans get their news from the west so here in the east berlin newsroom they fight capitalism with its own weapon by playing hollywood movies at the same time as the west's news they hope to keep their own audience when all is in order is werde ich fünf mal schießen alle fünf sekunden einmal okay East German television is uh, trying to stop their own watchers seeing West news and uh, information programs. There are seasons of Burt Lancaster and Robert Redford and something like that. Uh, entertainment against news from the West. But after the film comes the message. With an East German audience safely tuned to Robert Redford, they are then fed a propaganda program called the Black Channel, which attacks the West's news. Geheime psychische Experimente, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. The overall aim is to paint a horrid picture of our sordid, capitalist, morbid society. Was ist denn das? Amerikanisch? Hier ist das deutsche Fernsehen mit der Tagesschau. Central Intelligence Agency. We're far more rigid about what we do and what we think we can get away with. We get away with very little, in fact, compared to the to the rest of, of world television. I think people are far more critical and cynical of things. Stand by, Stand by Westminster. We couldn't get away with half what the Americans get away with. I mean, think of their advertising. A newscaster says, uh, I, uh, President Reagan has just died at the age of 77 from a coronary thrombosis. And now, you know, you too can live longer if you... And we could do that. You know, the saying is that we're the least worst television in the world, and I think that stands. Stand by Julian, please. Okay. In the Commons, Mr. Callaghan reported on the government's assassinations. The other party leaders expressed their sympathy for the families of the victims. Our political editor, Julian Haviland, was in the Commons. Take a beat. Two, Julian. There are times when members of Parliament, because there seem to be nothing they can do about the unending tale of murder in Ireland... In America, they actually believe everything they hear on television. President Reagan's only going to go on for, for ten minutes on television. He'll persuade America uh, whatever he wants to persuade them. Forget all the syndicated uh, articles that are being written in the newspapers saying the opposite. Put him on television and it's believed. But we know that the Sandinistas immediately began to persecute the genuine believers in democracy and to export terror. They went on to slaughter the Mosquito Indians by the thousands. Lose it. Of those who listen to the speech, 65% now approve, 23% do not. Nearly half the country heard the speech. A skillful user of the medium like uh, President Reagan is able to talk directly to people at home and bypass the Congress or any other governmental officials. And so he can mount great support for whatever it is that he's pushing at the moment. But what does anybody appear on television for as their politician except to influence public opinion? They don't appear just to use up time. Of course they appear to influence public opinion. You cannot govern a large and complex country with, without television anymore. I'm not sure you can govern it with television, but certainly cannot govern it without television. It's during election time that politicians seek television the most. They believe that if television can sell soap powder, it can also sell them. television has essentially done to politics, it has taken issues out of politics and turned it into a personality contest. Uh, I regret saying that uh, because I think that is not the way we choose leaders uh, that mean anything for us. Television means that it would be difficult for a man with a cleft palate to be elected, probably. This is how television takes the issue out of politics. The political party stays spectaculars for the camera. When there's a clash between the eye and the ear, the eye always predominates. If I were to say to you today that Ronald Reagan was having a bad day because he had staff problems, and there was dissension in his staff, and there was a difference in policy and dispute among his advisors, but what you saw was a confident Ronald Reagan standing in front of American flag with a lot of little American flags being waved in the audience and people cheering four more years. 
You wouldn't pay attention to what I say. You would pay attention to what you see. Thank you very much. I, I won't be a holdout. Let's make it unanimous. It would be impossible for a candidate to be elected today without television, I mean, to a national office. I think there's only one party leader who's been chosen because of his television uh, personality, and that is Mr. Neil Kinnock. I thought that uh, television had played such a key role in Kennedy's victory that it was important to maintain that television contact. May I ask you, so that I don't look too naive, a tough question right off the bat? And whether I'm a Democrat or Republican? <laughs> I think Kennedy owed uh, a lot to his uh, success on television. I think Reagan owes an enormous amount. His experience in, uh, in films, his relaxed style, I think had been enormously important. Well, there's no question that Ronald Reagan is a superb communicator. Absolutely the best, uh, better than Kennedy. If politicians use television, why shouldn't the church? John Paul is the first television pope. Everywhere he goes, he is filmed by the Vatican's own television cameras, a unit he ordered personally to be set up. I'd like to welcome you to God's People, the weekly Vatican report. Our program is brought to you each week from the Vatican Television Center in Vatican City. The Pope approved of the foundation of uh, this Vatican Television Center in 22nd October last year. That is the fifth anniversary of the beginning of his pontificate. Holiness, your coming to us within these walls brings a great light into our darkness. He is very good because uh, he is, uh, I think, a special charisma. This capacity uh, may, made of him a very good uh, uh, personality for the television. If politicians and popes use television, then why shouldn't unelected leaders use it too? Martin Luther King Jr. and all of us were using television and using it for good. I mean, that was a major demonstration. People were saying that we must complete this rally, we must start this march to make the evening news. And if community leaders use television, why shouldn't revolutionary leaders use it also? Take a clenched fist. It was television image, yes. For them, these were sensational events. Consequently, they were putting it on television to gather their viewers and to push up the uh, ratings for the commercial people who buy time onto the television stations. This is why, in fact, that it was spread so rapidly. And if television helped spread those images, did it help spread violence among the children of Northern Ireland? Did those images from Northern Ireland, in their turn, teach something to the miners' children? Eight out of ten people on Earth now have been born since the coming of television. And today, as on every other day, a quarter of a million new babies were born and a quarter of a million new television sets were manufactured. What are you kids doing here? Television can show you the face of the moon, but it can also show you the face and heart of man. And that's why this instrument is so crucial. The people who run it have such an obligation. Don't let Gotcha get you with the hands up on. Roll two feet on the dining Next week, how it all began with the race for television. Jane Fonda, Vanessa Redgrave, and Meryl Streep start next in the outstanding and highly acclaimed movie, Julia. Then join us for highlights of day two of the fifth cricket test.